Now, um, our final panel uh, is about to start. So I would like to introduce uh, our three, uh, three panelists. And I'll start with the European Parliament first. Uh, I would like to welcome on stage uh, Ivars Ijabs, member of the European Parliament and member of the Industry and uh, Research Committee. Then uh, I would like to invite Kinga Stanislavska. She's the co-founder uh, of Xperia Venture Fund and member of the EIC board. And last but not least, we have Alain Beretz. Uh, he's the president of COST. If you don't know, that's the first uh, European research program. Uh, thank you all for um, joining us uh, today. Um, so, you've heard the commissioner. There are plenty of problems, but plenty of opportunities to, uh, to solve them uh, as well. Uh, so, I, I want to start with a question to, to all of you, and maybe you can go first, uh, Ivars. Um, do you think... Uh, and again, I, I'm realizing that I'm repeating the question that I, asked the, that, that I asked the commissioner. Do you think it's important for you to um, have a more cohesive uh, research innovation landscape? Well, obviously, yes. Uh, and, uh, but the devil is in the details, as we all know. And the regarding approach to widening, I think that the very idea to increase the budget and also have uh, all those programs in the widening is uh, a very good thing, and we should proceed with that. Another dimension is, of course, the best uh, way to widen the participation is to make the Horizon program and all its part more efficient and more level playing field, uh, which would help uh, many innovators and many researchers also in the widening countries. And as we all know, there are certain problems. I completely agree with what Madam Commissioner just said about certain partnerships and consortia being closed clubs. Uh, we all know uh, what's happening right now with some of the programs like, well, uh, we will be probably talking about the EIC, but also about the EIT, that this widening part of those programs is not uh, running so smoothly as we would wish it. But um, nevertheless, I mean, there are many issues, but of course, uh, well, we should consider uh, widening also as a common European thing uh, to uh, get the potential out of all the member states, all the regions, uh, because uh, these numbers we are having right now with 94% uh, of the money going to the non-widening countries this is really an outrage. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick follow-up on that. You, said, you mentioned uh, Horizon Europe should have a level playing field. What, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, one of the things uh, that have been already mentioned before is, for example, purely technical issues like the involvement of consul consultancies in preparing the projects for Horizon Europe. We know that some countries are subsidizing this process. These are very often the countries with huge research budgets, which leads us again to this Matthews principle, which means that those countries who already have the potential and, and, and budget are also those countries who are getting the most of the program. But this is just one of the examples. Well, again, this is, I do not see any structural problems, but there, there are, well, many issues to be solved. Okay. Now back to the, the, my first question. Kinga, do you have, uh, what are your thoughts on, on uh, the importance of, of having a more cohesive R&I landscape? Well, um, I always think about global competitive advantages right. and technology sovereignty. And what we have discovered during the pandemic period is that Europe could do certain things and certain things could not. And I think that was very much a wake-up call for many people to understand that we need to cooperate closely together on all matters across all regions, jurisdictions, across Europe, with specialists in certain given fields being working closely together in a collaborative manner. This, of course, requires help, funding, networks, and many other supportive actions. But if we would like to develop and grow our technology sovereignty 
and be able to be competitive on the global landscape with the US, with China, we need to remember that those areas are spending three to 10 times more on certain policies than we are. And therefore, the key is in doing it, doing it right, and doing it in a magnitude of scale that will allow us to truly be globally competitive. Uh, thank you for that. We'll, we'll circle back to the technology sovereignty question uh, in a bit. But first, I want to hear from Alain. Uh, what's, your, what's your take on... Uh, thank uh, you, on, on and the... thank you for, for the invitation to myself and to Cost. Um, maybe I'll... I'll take the, the following point. Uh, you speak about cohesive, and I will come back to cohesiveness maybe later. But in fact, I would like to speak also about the critical mass. You're speaking about competition. Right. So the competition, you judge it on the global, like, exactly like you say. You, you judge it on the European scale, not on the country scale, not on a regional scale. And so we, we need to find devices to increase the competitivity of Europe. Then, of course, it has to have internal uh, rules. But if we don't increase the competitivity of Europe, exactly what you said, we will be in trouble. And I want to sp mention one E-word that hasn't been mentioned yet. This is important, is excellence. Because you can ju just, uh, there are W word widening and there is the E-word. If you don't have the E-word, the W doesn't count. It, it won't help. We need excellent centers, what, wherever they are. There are not national, and, uh, national symbols or whatever. We need excellence centers, and then we need to spread the excellence. That's widening. But if we forget the excellence, then we spread nothing. And th that's important. And I must say, and we'll come back maybe to it, uh, the issue of, let, let's put the les pieds dans le plat, as you say in French, uh, the, that Switzerland and UK are, are centers of excellence. We need them. As a scientist, I'm telling you, we need them. And for example, cost is still involving uh, in the building of networks. We still have on board UK and Switzerland, and I think we're very happy about this. Yeah. But this is another issue, of course, and I will close the book, but it's, it's something which is also important. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come to that issue later, but, but first, how do, you, how do we spread excellence? Uh, I mean, the commissioner said that these programs, uh, dedicated programs in Horizon Europe are not enough. Uh, and, you know, countries should look at the whole spectrum of, uh, of, of tools. Uh, so, but but what's, your, uh, what's your view on that? Who, who wants to take? Uh, well, there is no magic wand and there's probably a, an ecology of, of tools and saying I have the solution like this would probably be nonsense. Maybe I can speak, uh, uh, well, the commissioner was kind enough to mention cost. Which I don't think she mentioned any other tools, by the way, so maybe it's interesting. Uh, uh, we build networks. Instead, uh, and it goes back to the, the MEP argument before, we build networks between people not between organizations, not between countries, between people, scientists. And, and this is a kind of a scouting effect of a, a, way find, a pathfinder effect that can lead them to bigger projects, uh, more ambitious projects. And my lesson, I, I'm, I'm in cost for two years only, so I'm learning from cost and I try to spread the good word. I'm impressed by what cost is doing. Uh, is it's straightforward, it's simple. It's, uh, you said before there is, a, there is a, I mean, we don't need consultants to, to build a, a cost project. It's very simple. And you, for example, one, I don't want to give all the details, but one very interesting point is once you have what we call an action, but in fact, it's a network, anybody can join at any time. Yeah. It's very open. So for example, a widening country uh, scientist, they say, oh, this has started, I'm interested, can I jump into it? The door is open, they come in. So again, maybe we need more inventive devices, maybe less complicated, mm -hmm. and we need more communication between all our, our tools. Okay, uh, just remaining on the topic of building excellence, uh, one, one part of that is of course, uh, coming up with more effective uh, tools. Um, but the other part is money. Uh, and we know that a lot of member states in Central and Eastern Europe uh, invest 
very little in uh, research and development. So, uh, Ivars, what's your thought? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? How how can we convince member states uh, to invest more? The commissioner was optimistic, but I I, I don't think I share her optimism. <laughs> uh, very well. Uh, well, about the excellence part, uh, of course, right now I think this is an, a really an interesting question to debate uh, whether we uh, conceive excellence as the main and the only guiding principle also among the widening countries. This question has been recently raised by the European Court of Auditors, but nevertheless, I think this is really an interesting topic to be de debated because I, I, I don't have any clear answer. But regarding the finance of the member states, uh, well, uh, I mean, yes, what can the EU do in that sense? Uh, different types of synergies, different types of nudging the member states in the RRF, also in the Cassesian funds, to, to invest more. But also, I mean, the EU has always had uh, this very important tool of naming and shaming, if you want. I'm coming from a country which hasn't been very eager to invest in R&D, but even in Latvia, this has been always, during the at least last 10 years, an issue that we don't like to be at the very bottom uh, and very far from those 3% of the GDP that has been promoted by the European uh, research area. And in that sense, I think that, of course, there are also many smart tools to be used, I think that the seal of excellence of uh, the horizon is a very good idea to have, and this really makes, this is what you can see empirically, is that uh, those institutions that have been involved in, 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 in Horizon are really, well, having better results in terms of scientific publications and scientific qualifications. Thank you. Uh, you visited Hungary uh, last year, I think. Yes. Um, to find out how the research system works there. Um, and what was your impression? Well, this is a, a very broad topic, of course. Well, we all know that in many of those widening countries, the research systems are being reformed. They are in a process of some kind of a reform. They are expecting a reform. They have done a reform and so on and so forth. Uh, well, the Hungarian example is that uh, you can clearly see how this process of reform, which involves, uh, well, having independent boards, having... Uh, well, um, uh, certain criteria, market orientation, and so forth, how they are being used for political purposes. And that's why there is very little of uh, scientific freedom left uh, in uh, Hungarian uh, scientific uh, uh, institutions, at least the ones who are owned by, by the state and run by the state. Well, uh, in this uh, since, well, coming from a winding country myself, the main lesson is that, uh, well, uh, we should be always careful with what is meant by having a reform, because sometimes those reforms are really led astray from the basic principles of, of, of uh, scientific freedom and, and freedom of research. Thank you. Yeah, well, in, in Hungary, uh, the, reform meant, uh, the reform meant that uh, the research institutes of the Academy of Sciences were moved into uh, a new institution, which is in this other the subordination of, 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 of the government, basically. So that, that raises a lot of uh, and the, questions. And the government is, as far as I know, also nominating the board members for life, <laughs> which is yeah. quite, a, quite a strategy. So uh, my next question is on this topic. Are some governments too corrupt to invest Effectively, effectively and smartly. Well, in terms in, in for, of European uh, policy making, this was one of the uh, main messages uh, from the, my Hungarian uh, trip uh, from the Stoa panel in the European Parliament that, well, we should be, uh, well, careful with all the European projects that are geographically distributed. Because if they are run by governments, 
which they usually are, they well have a certain tendency to 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 be corrupted and the resources to be misused. So uh, well, I'm not saying that well the Hungarian research landscape is also very diverse and there are also pockets of of clear excellence in many different fields and so on and so forth. Yeah. But um, uh, well, that's why it's always important to have this uh, level playing field. And the second message from the Hungarian experience is that, well, we should probably consider also funding uh, more broadly individual researchers and not just huge research institutes, because there are many independent researchers and scientists who well, basically are outlawed by the ruling party. Thank you. Um, Thank you for that. Uh, so that, that's quite an interesting example, just to look at how things work in a particular country. Um, and now I'd, I'd like to talk a bit more about uh, what Alain mentioned on uh, in boosting cooperation uh, between uh, uh, cross-border cooperation and research innovation. Uh, so how can the EU 13 uh, countries uh, do a better job at that, at, at building networks and cooperating uh, uh, across the borders? You want me to yeah. <laughs> well, uh, first, I don't think they can do it alone. So yeah. the answer, putting all the burden on the EU, uh, on the, well, on the EU 13 would be a big mistake. Uh, let's start by the others. If the others don't do something about that, why should they? Because it's the interest of Europe. Because we work for Europe. We don't work for the interests of this or that country. And if we stay in this... And the whole is more than the sum of the parts. So if I think the, the uh, rich countries, put it this way, the more advanced in science, will find an interest for themselves to help the EU 13 to progress. Uh, I'm, Maybe wishful thinking, but that's important. And then, of course, uh, I don't, I'm not here to teach anything to the, to the EU 13 countries, but let's aside the, the investment issue, which is important, but let's not teach lessons. My own country, France, is doing very poorly. When you look at what money we have globally, we are doing very poorly to, towards the 3% goal. So, I won't teach any lessons. I'm, I'm not representative of my government, by the way, so I, <laughs> okay. I can speak very freely. Uh, but uh, maybe it's not just an issue of money. It's a, an issue of finding up very simple tools that can help also to bridge gaps and uh, of helping careers. Uh, for example, um, not uh, helping, making that uh, si um, mobility is, is not going to be uh, the, the issue of uh, um, having people not coming back is in fact sometimes can be bridged by very simple measures. For example, I heard we had an Hungarian, uh, I think it was in Hungary actually, yeah. uh, uh, an example that they put very little money to, to take scientists that were abroad and show them what was going on so they can judge and, and it's a one one month stay, you come look at what we're doing now, right now, and maybe you will come back. And so that, that those are things that are also very simple. And again, I'm advocate, advocating for network building. I mean, we need that the people work together and feel that they can do better if they get if they are doing this at home, getting the examples from others. And yeah. again, that's that's the whole issue about building up networks of researchers more than trying to build very complicated tools with limited access, as uh, yeah. I said before. Well, what COST is doing is building networks, essentially. Uh, what COST is only doing is building networks, yeah. nothing else. And so what is the impact on that, on, on, on researchers from the widening countries? Well, uh, I can give you, and I, I need my, my text here, but I can give you some, while I'm looking for the numbers, uh, maybe a word on the still Impact is a complicated issue in science. And okay. uh, we need to, uh, to, to speak about impact, but we need to refrain from uh, trying to put numbers commanding policies because uh, science is more complicated than that. But still, we have good numbers. I, I'll give you a few of them. 53% uh, of the budget of cost right now goes to widening countries. 
56% uh, of the main proposers, so the leaders of our actions, of our networks, are coming from widening countries, and 96% of our actions have at least one member from a widening country. Uh, the, what the output, this is just numbers again, but for example, and I think the Commissioner mentioned it very uh, quickly, when you come from a cost action, you triple, she mentioned it, but I think I want to explain this, you triple your chance you, of getting uh, another tool of, uh, yeah. of the European research area. It goes to 35% uh, success. Very simple. So, so that's, that's something that we are proud of. Also, something that we didn't mention is career boost. The, we have testimonies. I mean, 88% of the participants to uh, cost actions say that it was a great help in their career boost. And what is important for widening countries is helping young scientists to achieve rewarding and, and successful careers. So that's important. And just to say that all this is not at the expense of excellence, because I was mentioning excellence before, I have a few data on the relationship with cost and the ERC. So here we speak about the other end of the spectrum, the top of the excellence. Um, for 2022, for the proof of concept uh, uh, call, about one uh, laureate out of three have or have been active in cost actions. For the advanced grant, it's one out of five. For the consolidate, consolidator, it's only one out of seven, etc. But still, it's, uh, it's important. And the last, maybe not to drown you with numbers, that show you also that um, impact is difficult to assess. It's co-publication. Because co-publication means that you work together and you achieve results on, on a, an international basis with the uh, scientific review. So uh, there is about an increase of 55% of co-publication when you come from a cost action compared to the general public. And this increase seems to be long-lived. We have preliminary data show, showing that this increase is at least five years long. So those are examples that show that Cost, which is not very costly, by the way. Sorry for this. <laughs> uh, it, I think it's, it's, it's good for, for the euro, I would say. Mm. Right. Thank you for sharing those uh, uh, figures. Uh, uh, before we move to the next uh, topic of this conversation, uh, to the next back batch of questions, uh, are there any questions from the audience uh, so far? Well, if not, I'll let you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, let's get a microphone. Since I'm coming from, um, as I'm a diplomat, as a Hungarian diplomat working on this field, I have to reject what was said, or we discuss political issues, or uh, we are discussing and taking on the ground. So I have no other choice to say that uh, this was not correct and not entirely correct. And I know there are problems. We have structure problems. We have problems in each country. And I suppose we should keep and speak what we can do together because that's very important. We can do a lot together. And actually, the bio initiative, what we are doing we together, we are very much uh, trying to uh, cope with the networking. We are very much uh, trying to, to work together. And I think it's very important that, uh, that uh, we, we keep, uh, keep the spirit and, uh, and, um, and, and, and try to keep on that sense. Thank you. Would you agree to that? Yes. Well, uh, uh, I know that we are all in our former roles sometimes and, well, in terms of keeping the spirit of, of cooperation and the spirit of European unity, I am really happy to hear that you are also supporting that and, and let's move forward. Thank you. Uh, yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, Simon Pickard, Science Business. Um, it's a question for Kinga. Um, we've talked quite a lot earlier today about the, some of the struggles, the difficulties, um, but still the importance of public funding in supporting innovators, entrepreneurs, and scientific organizations in Central and Eastern Europe. But I'd love to hear from you whether you think the companies such as Xperia that you founded, whether venture funding 
private equity are now starting to rebalance the field, and if this is becoming a really important dynamic as a complement to public or European funding, to, I, I guess it's also about incentivizing the talent, the entrepreneurs and the scientists to develop their projects close to home. What role do you think your sector is going to play in making this a reality in the years to come? Thanks for that. Um, I do believe that it's not a, just about you know, the public sector putting money into things. It's also a cooperation with the private sector. And it's actually not even the private sector's investment that we ultimately need. We actually need revenue. Because it's absolutely wonderful to develop amazing projects, but they need to commercialize and sell. And that's why we're with science business. There's also a business part yeah. to this. So I'm more on that side. And uh, when I'm talking to the startups that I'm working with, I always tell them that the revenue is better money than my money. That's always better for you. You don't dilute. You have amazing clients. You build reputation. You build credentials you can sell on. And that is the goal of also what we're trying to do with EIC. An important part of that is business acceleration services, which we're constantly improving. But that is about finding the corporate relationship on the other side and putting those startups together. Now, in terms of Central and Eastern Europe, historically, the level of venture investment or actually angel investment, any kind of this you know, technology investment, has been super low. Um, it's about a third to a quarter of what is Western Europe, and that's about a third of a quarter of China or the US. So it's really... Small. What's the reason behind that? Well, historically, 10 years ago, there was no venture sector at all, but there were no startups either. So uh, what happened was a lot of um, Googles, Ebays, Ubers of this world came to Central Europe, set up their R&D centers, hired people, really smart, software engineers, and that built a whole pool of software engineers with a Western mindset. It's absolutely incredible what you see 10 years on, because when somebody was hired as the first or the second engineer into Google, managed 800 software engineers, they can easily today consider building their own company, because they know how it works, they know how to interact in an international field and a mindset, and they know how to raise money. So it's changing. In the past, there was no money, no startups, no venture. And now, if you think about widening countries, they're very different. So Estonia is the highest number of unicorns per capita in Europe, or globally, actually. It's over seven. Um, Poland has grown in terms of VC investment 50% year on year. And Romania has delivered a unicorn that has been a fund returner for quite a few European funds uh, in robotic process automation. So we need to also think about widening countries with this, uh, you know, this uh, light, with these success stories behind them that can deliver the next level of great companies and can encourage uh, scientists to move into a more of a commercial field that can encourage the next level of founders, that can build these success stories. Yes, we are behind. Uh, of course, I would love to see, you know, I was just looking at the statistics before coming here um, regarding last year. There's nearly 200 million euros that was allocated to France under the accelerator programs right. of, uh, of the EU. And um, if you look at Bulgaria, I think, or Croatia, we're talking about less than 2 million. There are also certain countries that were not allocated funds. You know, so what are the reasons? Well, there are multiple. Uh, I, th I think consultants play an important role here in teaching uh, scientists, teaching founders, what is the necessary level of preparation. Uh, and some countries are very good at this. Some have developed, you know, a kind of a Tesla uh, in terms of consulting services, and some are on the level of a moped or a Trabant. So uh, we need to also take that in mind. It's a constant improvement yeah. process. But I think what is very important to say here is science business is developing this whole new field for a newsletter. 
Uh, we had a meeting at CIC board today with the commissioner, and the term widening countries was extensively used with a big focus on thinking about how to bring more companies and with larger investment tickets and larger support from everywhere, from Cyprus, from Greece, right up to Latvia, because it's not just about yeah. the new EU. It's also about you know, a few other countries that are falling behind. So let's try to be inclusive. Let's try to build those networks, like Alain said. Very much is dependent on a personal level, on these personal connections. Let's showcase success stories. And let's move forward together in unity to, to try to really improve you know, Europe and, yeah. and its competitive position. You were, I have a follow-up on that. You were mentioning that uh, this gap is also visible in EIC competitions. Uh, so w uh, what, what's, what's missing there? Uh, what, what can be done to r reduce that? Well, I think, you know, if I think about Poland, for example, and now I have to go back a few years, uh, for Polish companies, getting grant funding was simpler locally than on a European level. So many companies received grant funding, and ultimately I believe that is funded from EU money. It's just from a different pocket, in fact, mm -hmm. and uh, selected locally. So we don't take this into account in statistics, of course. We think about, you know, the top level, but actually I, I don't know what the statistics would be if we took that into account. So depending on the availability of various programs in various countries, that has an impact, surely. Um, but I believe also showcasing success stories, using ambassadors to promote EIC is a very important role, as well as... Uh, just, you know, the, the discussions that we're all having and what we are doing, uh, promoting those successful founders, helping companies go to the next level, teaching them how to yeah. do the simple pitch. It, it's all these little actions that really deliver a bigger result. And I think with the, the focus, very strong focus and strong urgency to focus on widening countries, this will slowly, slowly move forward. Um. One, one more question on that. Uh, today in the newsletter, we had this story on uh, how the, the Polish biotech sector, um, enabled by a lot of EU funding, was able to um, build companies, uh, advanced companies. But the, their problem now is, is going international and scaling up at, at a different level. Um, so I, I know, is, is the, the, does the EIC... Uh, can the IC contribute to that, to, to solving that uh, issue in some way? The IC can now invest up to 15 million euros per company. That's the largest amount, plus two and a half million in grants. So 17 and a half million support is quite extensive. Uh, the largest round that EIC participated in was over 100 million euros. So mm -hmm. if we think about that, that's substantial scale up and growth capital. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, in the meeting uh, in Paris under the new French presidency, there was a discussion of creating scale-up funds uh, in Europe, which I believe EIF has taken the lead on. Yeah. This is also very important. If we want companies to raise scale-up money, we can't wait for the U.S. funds to come to us. We need to have our own funds that will back our own scale-ups, and that is also one of the priorities. But yes, it, at the moment, it's 15 million euro under the EIC, and that is quite substantial investment. Okay, thank you for that. Now, I'd like, on, uh, I'd like to move on to uh, the, the next topic of, of our conversation, and that's the, the international context that, uh, that we're in. And in the beginning, you mentioned, um, uh, you mentioned technology sovereignty. Uh, and why that's important for the for the EU, and and, and how uh, we can use all the potential um, uh, available in the EU for that goal. Uh, so my my question on that is uh, first to Alain, if I may. Um, the EU is engaged in this. Uh, science and technology race at the moment with China. So uh, can, 
can Europe win if you know half the continent is uh, has a poor track record or not an ideal track record in, in uh, research innovation performance? Well, there is an expected answer, right? <laughs> but maybe it's more it's it's more complicated. Again, yeah. uh, it's not just the issue of homogeneity. I think of response of our continent. We have the same problem in my own country. It's very heterogeneous in this aspect. So the issue is to be competitive as a whole. Again, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself, but to include, to tap exactly what you said, to tap, we have a lot of resources available in those countries that need to be tapped, that need to be fostered, that need to also find confidence in their own potential. And then the whole, the whole will benefit. But again, I'm some ways reluctant to say, we just have to have the same level of financing in every part of the country, the, just speaking of one country. So that, that's one, one yeah. very important point. One other point maybe that I can add there is that we, can, we have to think about Europe, but also we have to think of our neighboring countries that either knock on our door or just want to build uh, better friendship, uh, business relations and scientific relations with us. And that's another issue in which, by the way, cost can help because we have, uh, uh, we, we realm to the, what more or less, I would say the, the Council of Europe uh, geometry and not the EU, which means that this neighboring countries of the EU are also part of the game because they are European, not EU, but European. And let's not forget them in the way we build a community and the way we tap our resources, and well, we tap our intellectual or eventually uh, innovation resources. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, talking about neighboring countries and investments in, in, in innovation, uh, uh, the Commission has announced a, plan, uh, a funding, dedicated funding, from the EIC for Ukrainian startups. Uh, what, what's your what's your view on that? Uh, should <clears throat> is is that an opportunity for Europe as well to uh, to better connect uh, with its neighbors? First of all, uh, I believe that uh, we sometimes get very comfortable with things. Yeah. When we get comfortable, we don't make progress. And somebody we don't see overtakes us. And I think what we are seeing in Europe today is this loss of level of comfort. We have a, was it 47 million people country that have lost their entire level of comfort. But they are extremely resilient. They are working very hard on every level to try to move forward, maintain their sovereignty, to try to build from this, well, catalytic event. And I think that's, that's a big learning for all of us. Um, secondly, it's emigrants that usually move the world forward. Uh, it's those that come from another place that need to move quickly, that need to uh, build a home, that have something to show and I think for that reason, in me sitting in Poland, we have quite a substantial now, um, nearly three million people that have arrived, that have been welcomed by the Polish population. And that I hope this will be a huge, huge opportunity to boost the economy. Because it's very determined people that really, truly want to succeed. So I'm in full support of all of these actions uh, let's try to integrate them, let's try to use their dynamism and their determination, and let's fund them more if we can. I, I want to stay on this topic of technology, sovereignty, and, um, and, and the difficult international context uh, we're in. Um, it's, th this difficult context is one of the main reasons why the, the, the EU wants um, to, to develop and keep uh, technologies uh, in Europe. So, Ivars, this is a question for you. What, what do you think about uh, this plan? And do you think it can uh, help bridge the gap between East and West, or it will further widen it? Well, uh, 
I think that this the very idea of uh, open uh, technological sovereignty is a contested one. Uh, we all know in terms of having the basic, well, technologies and the key enabling technologies being located in Europe is a good thing and this is what we really need. Of course we all know how the things are proceeding right now with the CHIPS Act which is which we see is clearly not such an such an easy thing to, to, to accomplish. But nevertheless we should think strategically. Uh, in terms of uh, the EU 13 uh, being involved Yes, uh, well, there are, just like the colleague said before, well, there are many uh, examples how exactly the so-called new or EU 13 countries uh, well contribute uh, to uh, developing key enabling technologies like uh, photonics, microelectronics, and so on and so forth, uh, which is an important issue in the CHIPS Act in terms of, well, the pillar two, which is about manufacturing. I don't think, frankly speaking, that much of the pillar two is going to the uh, EU 13 countries. As for the pillar one, I think, and this is what we are doing right now in the European Parliament, uh, in the terms of the joint undertaking, uh, we should think uh, about, well, uh, also using that potential, which is uh, located somewhere east from the Rhine River, if you want. Okay, uh, thank you for that. I, I see we have a question uh, from our online audience, and I'll, I'll read it uh, to you. Um, so it says that, Widening countries, so universities in widening countries and research uh, centers have often a lot more easy money at their disposal from structural funds and the RRF plan, uh, and this discouraged them to enter a difficult competi competition like Horizon Europe. Should we introduce a little more competition on the easy money part so that the widening institutions have more incentives to enter the framework program competitions? Is, is this... Uh, what do you think of this this theory? You don't agree? I, I'm not sure I'm, I put competition as a major... I mean, I, I'm a scientist, so competition is... Competition taking as a sport. I mean, not aggressive competition. Uh, but I'm not sure competition is a value that is building up, uh, is a capacity building issue. Uh, I, I was more uh, surf on the structural fund issue. Because structural funds are very absent, in my opinion, from this uh, issue. And uh, while they are there precisely to bridge gaps, and they are not so much used to bridge the innovation gap or the scientific gap. So maybe there is a way of thinking to use better, and I'm not a specialist of uh, structural funds, but they're, they're, they amount to a lot of money. So why not have a... I'm speaking to Ivor more <laughs> than myself, and to th thoughts that try to funnel part, channel part of our, the structural funds to the goals that we have spoken about the whole afternoon. That would be maybe very interesting. I'm not, and not the, the way they are selected or not selected. Maybe that's not really the issue. Do you, well, any of yeah, you want yeah, to reply? I mean, uh, when we were working on, on this multi-annual budget, uh, the perception was back then in the 2019-2020 that the EU is slowly moving uh, away from this envelope type of money more towards program oriented, towards competition oriented money. Well, what's happening right now with the COVID and also with, of course, with the uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine, uh, well, I think that this process has somewhat stopped, but this is just my personal uh, feeling that, well, we still need those envelopes being given to the government. Okay. Uh, are there any questions from the audience at this point before I ask my final question to the panel? Okay. Uh, comment. Uh, it was a very important question, I think, from the, from the public, because uh, since I'm working on a thematic area uh, from top down and down top, uh, I can see that here connecting synergies between the different funds, how important it is, and we are programming in a different way a cohesion structure, uh, RRF, research, 
and CAP agriculture policy. So then it's very difficult to link the research component in it. So where we need to work and what I am hearing from the, from the business and the research uh, uh, sphere in my area is that let's work on the synergies, but not just then wording synergies, but programming and making some components, valid components in the programming and the principles there where you connect those programs to not to be totally separated uh, those programs. So here would help a lot in Eastern Europe, not that uh, to make more uh, 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 competition, but to help the programming to be connected behind those big policies. Thank you very much. I stop here. I am a little bit... Uh... Thank you for that. Mm. Uh, and I, th that's a very interesting comment because it brings me to my final question, which is what should we do next? Uh, are these instruments that we have, are they good? Can they be improved? Should, uh, should we rethink them? Uh, so w what, what should we do with, with, uh, uh, to improve EU uh, research innovation programs uh, in, in the next budgetary cycle? Uh, who wants to uh, take a guess, please? I always think that um, public money needs to be as close to the market as possible and therefore uh, requires agility, reaction, and feedback loop. And I think that's what is most missing, is these programs, they take a long time, they're not really, they have a lot of inertia. Uh, it's difficult to put the feedback back in, change something, and move forward. And if we could change anything, if I could have my dream scenario, it would be that. Uh, Talk to the market, get the feedback, change, reiterate, move to the next one in a year, and so on. Um, I, that would be What's okay. your dream scenario? Uh, I would say exactly like you and change market by scientific community, and you have, I have about the same talk. Uh, less devices. Everybody thought they had the magic wand. Lower the, device, lower the, the things by half. Uh, less red tape. You were speaking about the consultant. Less red tape. What, what's the point? Trust a little bit the, the scientific community because they will, the money will be there and a little bit more bottom-up possibilities so that, the, again, the market, the, the community can help building things. Those three, I won't judge the actual or give marks to the actual devices, but I think that, that would be three qualities uh, of future uh, policies of the EU. It looks like you have a bit of homework in the parliament. Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I would say let's preserve the budget of Horizon, uh, which is, to my mind right now, the most important task for all of us in this room because, well, this disproportionate cut uh, being proposed for the budget of 2023 is an outrageous one, especially in the context of our conversation today, because we all know that some countries, including mine, which are on the border uh, with the Russian Federation and Belarus, of course, we are expecting a certain meltdown of investment for obvious reasons, because we are very close to the front line right now. And of course, if there is less investment, we are expecting that, uh, of course, also the private investment, at least in the R&I, uh, is going to decrease, which imposes the role of public investment in a sense that, well, we need to, to go ahead. And in that sense, I think that the budget should be increased and not decreased. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, I would like to invite all of you to give a warm hand to our panelists. Thank you very much.